Okay, good afternoon all. Um, a lot of folks are entering the meeting now, so, so I, I want to welcome you. Do you hear an echo? Does anyone hear an echo or are you, are you okay? Yeah, a little echo. Hmm. But now it's better. Okay, let's see how it goes. Um, thank you all. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for our third meeting of the Massachusetts Deconstruction Work Group. My name is Kathy Mirza and I'm an environmental analyst for MassDEP. And as many of you know, yeah. as many of you know, I alongside Brooke Nash, our Municipal Waste Reduction Branch Chief. And through these meetings, we aim to connect stakeholders from all perspectives to share what we know, to learn together, and take meaningful steps to support this important part of the reuse industry in Massachusetts. So let's start with a little bit of housekeeping. Um, first, as you can see, when you hop on, this meeting is being recorded. And the recording will be made available to all attendees and posted on MassDEP's website. Um, I'd appreciate it if you could please be sure to put your name and organization um, on your image so that we can see that. If you're unfamiliar with Zoom, you'll wanna click on the three dots in the top right corner and select rename. Or you can click participants icon and rename yourself there. Um, we also ask if you could please uh, be sure that your microphone is on mute during the presentation so that minimizes any background noise. If you have questions or information to share, and we certainly hope that you do, please use the chat box at any time throughout our presentations today. We want to hear from you. We want to connect. That's what this is about. So what I'd like to do next is I'd like to launch a brief poll as people come in and get a pulse on who's in the room today. So let me launch this. And if you could take just a couple of seconds and respond to the poll and let us know what sector you represent, please. You may need to scroll down because there are 10 options. So if you don't see it right at the top, just please take a moment and scroll into it. And we're getting most people responding. If you're just jumping on, um, hopefully you can just respond to this poll in the first moment, couple of seconds here, so we can see who's on the call. We have, let's see, 100 people on the call right now and about 80 have participated. So I'll give just a couple more seconds so we can get everybody in there. Okay, so let me... And this. Okay, and hopefully you can see the results that we have folks representing um, most of the different segments that we have here, whether it's general contractors, architects, government, deconstruction folks, historic preservation, reuse, waste and hauling. Thank you so much for taking the time to do that. I really appreciate it because we had many people register for this today. So um, how this got started briefly, um, MassDEP released our Reduce and Reuse Action Plan back in the December of 2021. And through uh, many stakeholder meetings, we identified building materials as a priority stream for reuse. And this led to the development of the Deconstruction Working Group, which met for the first time last fall. So our working group is led by this planning team that represents industry, nonprofit organizations and officials from federal, state, regional and local government. It's been a privilege to work with these uh, leaders and practitioners who bring their expertise to our efforts. Now, while we're focusing on deconstruction and reuse, probably this goes without saying, but we're here because we have a disposal capacity shortfall both in Massachusetts and in the Northeast in general. And in our solid waste master plan, we have some pretty aggressive waste reduction goals to reduce the disposal of C and D materials by more than a quarter million tons by 2030. Kathy, uh, can you yes. share the screen right now? We're not seeing your slides. You're not seeing the slides. No, okay. You just have to hit share screen and then should be good to go. Have you seen any of them? Gracious. Okay. Um, 
faces that are. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Um, I'm sorry about that. I okay. Thank you for letting me know. Um, let me move this over here. You're so good. now you, you've moved around on my screen, though. So hold around. Hold on a second, please. I'm kind of okay. So um, I, I was really just trying to get through this slide, thank you. So why focus on deconstruction and reuse? I was mentioning the disposal capacity shortfall, both in state and in the Northeast, and that we really wanna divert these valuable materials to much higher value uses. Um, this slide lays out some of the goals that we have for our deconstruction work group. For those of you who've participated before, you've seen many of these. It's about connecting and increasing our awareness and um, education about the waste disposal crisis, helping to build the reuse industry in Massachusetts, connecting stakeholders who are all a part of this equation to help us move the needle forward. I won't go through all of the text on this slide, but I wanted to just have it in here so for folks who look back at the presentation can see some of the highlights that are from the previous meetings that we've had and if you go to our website, which is at the end of this slide deck, I have the link in there, you'd be able to see um, the complete presentations from our previous two meetings and also a recording of those meetings. In September was our kickoff meeting where we talked about demystifying deconstruction and mentioned um, how much of our waste stream is comprised of C&D materials. We spoke about embodied carbon and we spoke about some policies and practices that could help us move forward. And then at our second meeting in December, we had several practitioners who have been working in the deconstruction realm for decades, and we learned a lot from them. Several of them are on the call today as well um, to help inform our conversation, but we learned a great deal about the possibilities here, how many material streams can be captured through deconstruction, and how this supports uh, green collar jobs and much more. So I will stop there and I'm gonna move forward and hand the torch over to Michael Orbank, who's going to frame our meeting and introduce our speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Hello everyone, my name is Michael Orbank and I'm a Mass DEP deconstruction working group member and a professional capacity. I work as a sustainability manager for the SDO building group representing Structure Tone of Boston I also co-chair the CLF Boston New England Reuse Working Group, focusing on decarbonizing the built environment through deconstruction and building material reuse. Today's topic is on... There you go, I made myself. Uh, diving a bit into current strengths and future opportunities. Next slide. Currently, looking at uh, Massachusetts, while there is a comparable difference between materials and product reuse in residential versus commercial capacities, both market sectors are ultimately unrealized. Currently, there are dozen, dozens of outlets across the state for residential building materials, but most are smaller in scale, working in very specialized capacities. Commercial materials are much harder to find reuse outlets for. Most building products are procured as new, manufactured from raw materials, shipped to site, installed and then demolished and thrown away at the end of their perceived life. Occurring in both the residential and commercial capacity, this linear waste ideology is contributing to a crippling waste problem for Massachusetts. For reuse vendors, quality goods to resell and reuse is dependent on the extraction methods. These goods need to be deconstructed or salvaged properly and much of Massachusetts does not have the depth of deconstruction expertise needed to actually achieve this on a grand scale. Additionally, these materials need space to be stored and systems to be properly managed, much of which is without right now. The efforts are seemingly siloed with the vast majority of building materials that can be reused, not being reused. While one reused vendor may be an ideal destination for a certain material, ignorance of that outlet as a potential end market means that oftentimes these materials go to waste. Success stories are unshared and pain points in the process are relived over and over again. A growing need to break the business as usual mindset for material waste is becoming apparent in the building industry. As owners, policymakers, and decision makers champion bold claims of zero waste goals and a reduced carbon footprint, the need for circularity is rising. Increased collaboration between the stakeholders as well as education for these stakeholders is sorely needed. For the attendees on this call, you should be asking yourselves, what does better policy look like? 
Does it come from a deconstruction ordinance, a permitting incentive, adaptive reuse requirements? Where does the building industry have the most impact? Can manufacturers rework products to be more circular? Should architects design for deconstruction or specify for reuse? What can contractors do to provide reuse outlets with these quality goods? How can reuse vendors expand their services? What does it take to increase material acceptance and throughput? Should a reuse outlet specialize in certain products or refurbishment? Lastly, what choices yield the most benefit for owners? Is it ultimately the cost that determines the factor or can waste carbon and ESG goals necessitate better material choices? Next slide, please. Today's presentations will help showcase that there are outlets available and that they need support from every stakeholder in the building industry to grow. The mindset of out of sight, out of mind needs to be challenged regarding waste. With Massachusetts running out of landfill space and the climate crisis bearing down on us in full effect, remember that waste is ultimately lack of creativity. Before we get to the speakers, ponder the following questions. What reuse opportunities exist right now, both being presented in other parts of Massachusetts? How can these reuse outlets grow to meet rising need? And what can you do to help contribute? Today's speakers represent reuse outlets across Massachusetts, as well as a successful reuse vendor from Pittsburgh that embodies circularity and hopes to detail what others can do to create similar success stories. As a reminder, please submit any questions you have over the chat. After all presentations, there will be a Q&A session afterwards in which attendees can have their questions answered. Our first presenter is Boston Building Resources and Cord Jablonski, who will speak to the current capabilities and achievable plans going forward for material reuse. Court. Next slide. All right. Uh, thank you, Michael. It's it, fabulous to be here with everyone. I've been on a couple of these meetings. Um, you know, I'm relatively new in my role here at BBR. I started late last year, uh, but it is really nice to be here with such a broad group uh, of robust enthusiasm for the work that we're all trying to do together. Um, so BBR uh, Reuse Center is one of two organizations under the BBR umbrella. We also have a member-owned cooperative uh, that sells new building materials. Um, but the Reuse Center began in 1993 uh, with a mission to inspire, educate, and empower homeowners to increase the efficiency and value of their homes. Um, what's not explicitly noted here is the organization's commitment to sustainability um, and landfill avoidance. Um, you know, I'd say, I, I hope that the photograph that you see here of the new building that opened in spring of 21 underscores that. Uh, this is a, a zero carbon uh, building and uh, we were excited to have actually reached that uh, benchmark um, at the end of February of this year on a trailing 12 months where we were producing more energy than we were consuming. Um, next slide, please. And so here you can see the, the inside uh, of the building when you come through the front door, this is the sales counter. Um, and we process and resell donated building materials valued at a little more than $2 million a year. Um, about 75% of those sales are to low and moderate income, uh, what we call plus members. So these are folks who pay a lower price than the general public would. Um, and it really is you know, fundraising and pure philanthropy that underwrites those discounts. So it's a, a somewhat unique model in that way. And you know, important to understand as I talk about how we think about the economics of, of reuse and, and our business. Um, customers are both individuals, uh, other nonprofits, small residential contractors and, and uh, landlords. Um, next slide, please. So one of the you know, sort of unique elements of the Reuse Center is that we do run a, a relatively robust schedule of educational workshops. So you know, the model is to not only provide the materials, but also provide the skill set to help people keep their homes in good repair. Uh, so we run a spring program and then also a fall winter program. Uh, and on the left-hand side of the slide, you'll see just a few of the titles of, of active workshops. Um, and these pictures on the right, we, we relaunched this year a, a program that had run many years ago, Intro to Tools for Women. And um, I, I couldn't find a better picture, but I'd like to just make note of the, the woman who's hunched over her router at the far end of the table. Um, you, you can't tell from here, but what was one of the really cool things about this uh, event is we had very young people in it. And she's close to 80. Um, so I, I ran into her and had a chance to meet her one on one um, in the Reduce Center. She was buying materials uh, to make use of her newfound skills. Um, I, I also understand she was the most eager to get her hands on the Sawzall when uh, that time came. Uh, next slide, please. 
So here's just a little bit more imagery of the inside uh, of the building. And you know, th these four categories are really our kind of major product categories. And um, you know, we also like them because with the exception of, of lighting, um, you know, they're relatively easy to receive and process. They're bulky. Um, people bring things to BBR both at the donation store, but we have two vehicles that we go out into the community throughout greater Boston and uh, retrieve things. But, you know, they're relatively easy to handle. They're relatively straightforward to price and get onto the sales floor. Um, and if you look in the upper right hand corner of the kitchen cabinet image, you'll see an example of the, the pricing um, you know, structure that I mentioned where this, the public price would be $4,500 for that cabinet set, but plus members would pay 3000. Um, next slide, please. So, you know, one of the really interesting things about, you know, this sort of business is it, you know, I think pricing is really an art, right? It's, um, it's very subjective with reused materials. Uh, most buyers are relatively price sensitive. Um, and, you know, we're in the somewhat unique circumstance at BBR of, you know, really not needing to optimize for price. You know, we fundraise to underwrite these discounts. So, you know, the, the paradox is the, the larger we are and the more we grow, right, the more we need to fundraise. So, so we want to optimize pricing, particularly for the general public and the standard members. Um, but we, we are focused on how quickly we're moving goods through, you know, our facility and getting them into the hands of people who can use them. Um, so you have a, the image on the right shows a little bit of the area that we use for receiving and, and Vinny, uh, who does most of the, the work of, um, you know, getting goods through priced uh, and ready to be inventoried. And, and then I, you know, wanted to include this the sort of typical supply demand curve on the right hand side and, and just, you know, share the observation that in, in this business, at least for us, right, supply is seemingly endless. Um, and, and that's why the supply line um, is missing, right? It's, it's almost uh, not nearly, it's almost not relevant to us. There's, there's no shortage of goods. It's really more, you know, how do we make sure we're bringing the, the right goods in and how are we getting them to the floor quickly? Um, and with regards to pricing, you know, we'll buy us to price a little bit high rather than a little bit low. And if inventory doesn't clear, you know, quickly, like within a week or two, then we'll bring price down until we find, you know, that right, that sort of right price where it's in somebody's hands and it's out the door. Um, next slide, please. So, you know, as we think about how, how it is that we wanna grow and where that opportunity is, right? With the backdrop of there's, there's no shortage of things that we could be selling. Um, you know, we're starting to think more structurally about how do we prioritize high impact merchandise, right? So high impact, both from the perspective of useful to the end user. So, you know, a box of fasteners is sort of useful, but, you know, a, a new inbox uh, plumbing fixture that would otherwise be out of the reach of someone economically is probably more impactful longer term, right? It's going to last longer. They don't need to hire a plumber to replace it in 10 years. Um, but so how can we quantitatively think about that in these different product categories? And then also, how do we marry that with considerations like embodied carbon and what's the environmental impact of, say, keeping, you know, a door out of a landfill versus keeping that faucet out of a landfill? Um, you know, I talked a little bit about some of these bulkier, larger product categories, but you know, one thing that's been really interesting over these past couple of months to learn and to see is um, how significantly small items um, drive foot traffic and repeat visits. So the, the image you see on the right hand side is the aisle that we would call tiny treasures. So these are all items that are priced under $5. Um, and, you know, it, it is true that though it's not a an enormous percentage of revenue, it is something that brings people in. And so they come in, you know, looking for the kind of the bargain and the thrill of the hunt, and then invariably will leave with something more substantive. Um, you know, a, a large component of our marketing machine is an email list that's been built organically over the past couple of decades. Um, you know, we're lucky it's got a great response rate. And you know the goal with that is it goes out weekly. It's called the short news. is is not to really be fully transparent about all the inventory that we have or that might be available, 
but that's um, well curated into a, a short list of you know six or eight items um, that are really the teasers that bring people in. And then you know our job is to make sure if the item that was in the short news is gone and is sold that we have enough other things that uh, are of interest that keep people coming back. Uh, next slide, please. So you know this we talked a little bit here about the sort of revenue side and the pricing side and, and how we think about that. The the reality for us is that cost of goods very much is the um, embedded staff costs to process a donation. And as I mentioned, we, people bring things both to the facility, uh, but we also go out and retrieve things. And you know, the left the left hand a set of images, you know, show you the the things that we you know hope to get more of and that we work to get more of as we go out and solicit donations. So the upper left image is um, new old stock of plumbing fixtures, you know, unused, new in boxes. Uh, so easy to price, easy to um, get out onto the floor and to sell and, and very high value to our constituents. Um, the two images on the bottom were uh, delivered by this lovely fellow who brought, you know, a dozen bins, each one labeled, uh, and this thing's the light bulbs, and sure enough, you open it up and that's what's in it. Um, the, the flip side is an image I took, actually I took early on uh, when I joined and, and spent some time riding in the truck just to sort of see what that experience was like uh, for the team that does that. And, you know, this guy had uh, sent a bunch of images of things that were good and useful to us and were within our guidelines and then, you know, really wanted us to take these other things off of his hands so that he didn't need to deal with them. So we spent a lot of time working on, you know, how we engage with the donor, um, you know, from the first point of contact when they fill out the submission form on the website. Uh, and Paul, who's on this call, you know, does a lot of work to sort of vet that, collect the images, um, and to make sure that the donation is really likely to be uh, something we can make use of and is useful to, you know, to our end users. Um, but that's, you know, I think, always for all of us that are in this. Um, you know, an evolution to get that uh, messaging uh, just right. It's hard. Um, next slide, please. So, so as we think about kind of where do we go from here, we've got this, you know, wonderful new building and, you know, we can grow the top line, I think, significantly within that space. Um, be you know curious to connect with others on the call that are in this space to think about how you know, they view the upper bound of revenue per square foot, but we're looking at what other hardware stores and, you know, other retailers of building materials do, and we think we have headroom there. The, the challenge is, is it is for all of us, is that processing um, donated goods takes a lot of space, right? It takes a lot of space to move kitchen cabinets in, to maybe make some of the repairs, to get them priced, to inspect them. Um, and so I, I do think we're, it's likely we're all always short on space, right? Um, so how we use that and how we use that more efficiently uh, becomes a challenge. And then as we think about opportunities in the commercial market, you know, storage plays a larger and larger role. Um, so we're constrained on storage space now and you know, that's okay. We, we're sort of pricing to move goods through quickly. So we, we really don't wanna sit on inventory very long. But obviously, the commercial markets have a larger disconnect between, you know, when goods are liberated from wherever they are to where they're going, and they need to be housed somewhere, right, while that matchmaking occurs. Um, it, our other uh, sort of challenge that's ahead of us for the next 12 months, I'd say, is just refining and um, upgrading inventory systems and transactional systems like POS. Uh, sort of how we, you know, our point of sale system, how we transact um, at the counter. Uh, and so we're taking sort of the next, you know, balance of this year to uh, invest in those systems and build those processes that can support not only continued retail growth, but doing that also with an eye of how we might participate um, in the commercial markets. Uh, next slide, please. So, so this, I just, I wanted to share this observation and, and many of you may wonder why, why is enterprise software or software being mentioned here? But the, I spent the first part of my career in tech and I, I can see these parallels between um, what happened in open source with software and sort of where we are all collectively on this call now, 
right? And so open source software was software that was created and, and then made publicly available for anybody to take, to build upon, to modify, to sell, to build businesses on. And, and when this movement began in the late 90s, you know, folks thought the sort of those that were at the forefront of it had, had more or less lost their mind. Um, and, and that industry has gone from $100 million 20 years ago to $25 billion. And it, it underpins many of the technology tools that we all use every day. And so it reminds me a lot of where we are now with this group, where the supply of goods is relatively endless, the opportunities are completely open-ended, and you know, we're all incented to work more closely together rather than to think about these opportunities as, or these situations as competitive, right? Um, so if you jump to the next slide, please. Um, you know, I, I've started to just kind of consider within that, with that as the backdrop, um, who, who are the people and who are the entities that BBR should be working with? And it, and it kind of comes into these three buckets, right? It's other reuse organizations. Um, you know, how can we share leads? How can we share, um, you know, donations that are offered to us that are maybe outside of our specialty or capabilities and make sure those are referred out to a partner organization, you know, in a timely fashion so that they can make use of it. Um, how do we cross market and cross promote customer success stories? Because I think that is, you know, telling, telling others how folks have taken materials and reused them is one of the most powerful things we can do collectively. And then how do we share best practices as we're all evolving our inventory systems and how we go about selling and how we go about sharing. Um, you know, local industry, both as donors and consumers, uh, you know, need to be cultivated. Uh, I think sort of the things that we would all do there are, are relatively obvious, but on the consumer side, I would make the observation that in the last couple of decades, things have become, uh, the wind is at our backs, right? Reuse is hip and it's cool now with a younger demographic. And so how do we help um, businesses understand that more clearly and use that as a marketing tool? And then on the policy side and policymakers, um, you know, state and local government in Massachusetts is about 18% of GDP. Um, so state, state and local uh, entities buy a lot of stuff. And so I think there's an opportunity not only to, you know, create policy and be very thoughtful there, but also seek opportunities to make use of reused materials um, when you're doing construction projects or when you're renovating uh, or when you're doing an office build out. Um, next slide. Please. Thank you. Um, and you know, last I just wanted to speak specifically to the commercial markets and, and how we're thinking about them. Um, the, the short answer is it's early um, for us, we're, but we are beginning to think about what are the right product categories for us to participate in? Where can we make markets? Um, Hi, and, Preservation. This is Tina. Sorry. And, and then I'd say on, on deconstruction, you know, the actual work of getting things out, um, you know, those workforce development opportunities are very interesting to, to us, you know, both to, to me and many members of the board, uh, you know, what our role is there. I think it's still very early as we build out infrastructure and processes to support it. But, um, you know, these are things we're excited about. Uh, and then just a shout out to Kristen, if she's on the call and the fine folks at Elkis Manfredi, I did want to share a picture of cabinets we pulled out of Simmons University, the building that's coming down. They are now the foundation of our new uh, workshop here at BBR. So thank you to each of you involved with that. Uh, and, and last slide is just my contact info. I would look forward to connecting with anyone who has thoughts on how we can work together and uh, how you know we here at BBR can be helpful and, and useful to each of you. Uh, so thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Cord, uh, for that look into BBR. Uh, next up, we have John Celeste, a material recovery specialist from EcoBuilding Bargains, who will be speaking about reuse vendor capabilities and modeling a circular economy. John? Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, good afternoon. And first of all, I'd like to thank you very much to MassDP for inviting us to speak here. Um, I am here on behalf of EcoBuilding Bargains, uh, where our main goal is to divert reusable building materials from entering the waste stream. Um, I just plan on giving you an overview of our store, uh, go over some materials that we accept as donations, and go over our process uh, of saving all those materials. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, just a little bit about me. Uh, my name is John Celeste. My pronouns are he and him. And for those who don't have access to video, I've got uh, shoulder length curly brown hair. I've got blue eyes. I wear glasses and I've got a short beard that I like to call salt and cayenne pepper because it is red and white instead of black and white. But uh, I'm a material recovery and donations consultant uh, at Center for Ecotechnology, which is CET. Uh, I've been with CET for three years now, and I work to support eco building bargains uh, by garnering donations of reusable building materials uh, in the residential aspect. Um, I work with contractors to identify projects like uh, kitchens and bathroom remodels, uh, where the old kitchens and the old bathrooms are still in good condition and those materials can be used elsewhere. Um, in this type of scenario, we work with the homeowners and the contractors to deconstruct uh, and donate their old kitchens and bathrooms rather than demo and dump them into the waste stream. Um, I also work with building material suppliers and lumber yards uh, instead of throwing away uh, materials into the waste stream that can no longer be sold, such as uh, dead stock, uh, discontinued items, misorders, etc. Uh, they donate those materials to our store as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here is a little picture of our our building. This is Eco Building Bargains. This is Center for Eco Technologies uh, Reuse Store. Um, it is the largest uh, reclaimed and surplus residential building material store in New England. Uh, Eco Building Bargains accepts donations of quality home improvement materials and sells them to the public at a steeply discounted price. Um, our customers, they love the unique style, uh, the quality, uh, the value of these reclaimed pieces. Um, and we work to help owners and contractors prevent perfectly good building materials from hitting those landfills, uh, and then really to make home improvements more affordable for more people. Uh, we are an environmental nonprofit organization, and we do work hard to live up to our slogan, we make green make sense. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is this is kind of a slide of uh, where we were and, and where we are now. Uh, our store opened in 2001 as the Restore Home Improvement Center uh, at a grand uh, 3,000 square feet. Uh, in 2003, we expanded to over 8,000 square feet. Um, and then in 2005, we began explain, uh, planning for expansion. Uh, in 2007, we started looking for a building and raising funds. Uh, and then in 2011, we changed the name to Eco Building Bargains, uh, and we opened our expanded location, uh, where we now have 30,000 square feet of storage and selling space. Um, we have a wide variety of visitors. Um, this ranges from do-it-yourselfers uh, to contractors uh, and, and really anyone uh, looking for a way to have a quality project done for a significantly smaller price tag. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> yes, it does. It, it takes one heck of a team to work on this mission. Um, and we really do have what I call an all-star recycling and reuse team. Um, and that is thanks to Jay McCauley, who is our director of retail operations. Um, we also have uh, Darcy Ratty, who is our retail operations manager. Um, she manages the entire store, uh, including helping receiving um, all of the incoming materials, uh, pricing, uh, merchandising. Uh, she really oversees the entire store. Um, Mike Jaycott is our material recovery and donations coordinator. Uh, I work with Mike very closely as he schedules and oversees all of our pickups. Um, Mike is an integral piece to our process by making sure that everything is on schedule uh, and he works with the timeline of, of the contractor's projects. Um, and he also oversees all the donations that come directly to the store. Um, Freya Bromwich is another material recovery and donations uh, um, consultant. Uh, Freya and I work alongside each other covering different uh, areas that eco building bargain services. Um, Trish Cataldo is our e-commerce sales coordinator. Uh, Trish plays a very important role in our resale of these building materials um, as e-commerce is responsible right now for approximately 10 to 15 percent of all of our sales. Um, and then John Hopkins and Malik Rodriguez they are very important members of the team as well. They are the smiling faces that you would most likely see uh, when we come pick up the building materials uh, being donated from your site. Uh, next slide, please.
Well, this is a lovely map of the area that we service. Um, I personally cover uh, Eastern Massachusetts, so basically uh, Worcester, east to, to Boston. Um, I also cover the Cape and the islands along with Rhode Island uh, and parts of Southern New Hampshire. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, Freya Bromwich, another material uh, recovery and donations consultant. She covers Western Mass, uh, Eastern New York and Long Island, uh, Connecticut and Southern Vermont. We do not currently have a team member that covers that little area in blue, but we are always adding to our team. So if any aquatic friends that can help us out, just let us know. <laughs> Next slide, please. All right, so through eco building bargains alone, we have we've been able to divert over 300 tons of material from lands uh, from landfills, and we serve over 300 contractors per year. Um, we're able to do this by assisting contractors in reducing the CND waste um, and diverting those materials from the landfills. And this is only possible with the help of conscientious homeowners, uh, contractors. Um, we're always looking for more donations. Uh, we have the space. Uh, we're definitely always looking for more donations. And more donations that receive really just means the more that we save from going to the landfills. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so I just wanted to go over some of the materials that Eco Building Bargains accepts. Uh, there are thousands of materials that can be reused, uh, cabinetry, countertops and sinks, um, bathroom fixtures, doors, light fixtures, hardware, uh, architectural salvage, uh, surplus building materials. Um, this is a small list of what we're able to accept. We also accept appliances in the kitchen like stoves, refrigerators, um, dishwashers, washers, dryers. Um, there is an age limit to those items uh, and they do have to be in good working order. Uh, but that being said, every aspect that we do is personalized and it's free. Uh, so I always tell the folks that I'm working with, if you ever wonder if something can be donated, uh, just schedule a free site visit uh, or snap a picture and send it to my cell phone uh, and I can get it approved, uh, approved for donation because the, the materials is kind of a moving target all the time. Uh, next slide, please. These were just some pictures uh, that I had come across uh, and I have, I have a lot more like this. Uh, these are just a few of the recent kitchens and bathrooms uh, that have come to us in donations. Uh, now, as you can see, these are all perfectly good kitchens uh, and bathrooms that can be reused. Um, it's, it's actually kind of wild to think that all these beautiful kitchens could be taking decades to decompose in a landfill, you know, rather than being reused, recycled and, and sent off to our restore. Uh, but our goal is to get as many of these kitchens, as many of these bathrooms, as much building materials into our store and, and away from those landfills. Next slide, please. So I just quickly wanted to kind of go over our process. Um, this kind of this kind of goes back to demystifying the difficulty of actually saving uh, these building materials. Uh, first step is pretty easy. You call us to, to discuss a project. Um, you know, we'll discuss the entire scope of the project that you're working on. Um, we try to, you know, we try to work seamlessly into your timeline. Uh, so this is generally a large part of the conversation going over that scope of the project. Um, as I said before, everything that we do is free. So we would set up a free site visit to identify any reusable building materials. Um, on this site visit, we'd go through everything in the project that can be donated. Um, and then we'd also locate a area where those materials can be staged for pickup. Uh, and we really like to do this site visit because it, it it's amazing how many items or how much building material that are coming out of a project people don't even realize can be reused or can be donated. Um, so we like to we like to go through tag everything um, really really try and get as much uh, away from that landfill as possible. Um, and the best way is you know if there's a garage on site this is usually the ideal staging location. Um, but if that's not possible like I mentioned before uh, we work hard to fit into your timeline so if materials must be staged outside you know, we just ask that they're covered by a tarp to protect from any potential weather. Um, and our ideal lead time is about two weeks prior to starting a project. Um, so really it's, you know, it's not even, you know, this isn't months of planning we're talking about a couple of weeks before your project's starting. You give us a call, we go through this conversation um, and we do our best again to work around your schedule to make sure that everything is seamless. Uh, next slide, please. 
step two. Yes, this is where the uh, this is where the magic happens. All right. Um, so this is where the contractors would deconstruct, uh, dismantle, uh, remove reusable building materials from and, and place them in a discussed staging area. Um, there are just a couple things, uh, really simple things that we asked before our truck team does show to pick everything up. Uh, we just ask that, you know, nails and screws are removed for safe handling. Um, and then very important when it comes to cabinets, um, counters and uh, drawers and doors. We ask that all of those drawers and doors stay on the cabinets uh, and and in the and in the cabinets, um, just because we need to make sure that we do have full sets coming back uh, to our store so they can actually be reused. Um, and and really, this this step is where we could we could really call on the community and really ask for help from the community. Um, we work with several companies that specialize in deconstruction now. Uh, we work with Waste Knot out of Cape Cod. We work with Mad Dog Demolition out of uh, West or Metro West Boston. Um, but we're always looking for new partnerships. Um, we'd love to work with more contractors uh, that share that desire for our mission to be successful. Um, and this, this can seem like a pretty daunting task at first, uh, but we work with new contractors all the time. Um, this is something that we do. There are a couple of common reactions that I get after our first projects together. One of them being along the lines of, I didn't even realize how much space this would have taken up in the dumpster. Uh, you know, it's, it's amazing once you realize that you're filling up an entire garage of materials that are being removed, how much space that would fill up a dumpster. Um, and then the, another very common one I get is that was much easier and a lot less time consuming than I thought it was going to be. Um, so like I said, we're always looking for new contractors to work with. Um, and really after our first project together, the, the process becomes turnkey, um, which is why many of our donations, a good portion of our donations come from repeat contractors uh, that are referring jobs to us. Uh, next slide, please. Step three, this is our free pickup service. Like I said before, I'll stress it again, everything that we do is free to you. Um, this can be scheduled through myself and Mike Jaycott, which I had mentioned before as well. Uh, we try to schedule this two weeks prior to arrival, but uh, again, this is all personalized. And you know, we, under, we understand that timeline shift and work is delayed. Uh, so communication is key uh, so we can save as much as we can. Um, and in the essence of time, it's easier for you to drop the materials off in our store. That is an option as well, uh, as long as the materials are pre-approved. Uh, and then once our materials reach a store, uh, we receive them in. Uh, and after they are received in, we produce that tax deductible receipt uh, for a charitable donation that's given to, that's given to the donor. Um, but that is Eco Building Bargains and our mission in a nutshell. Again, I just want to say thank you very much for inviting us here today. I'm very happy to be a part of this community, uh, and I look forward to, you know, to really saving and reusing as much as we can. Next slide. And this is just, uh, we're going to save the, con uh, the questions for the Q&A session at the end, uh, but this is all of my contact information as well. Again, thank you very much, Michael. Thank you, John. Our last speaker is Andrew Ellsworth, CEO of Doors on Hinge in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, speaking on both his work, uh, the company, well, the work that his company does, as well as other stakeholders in any region uh, can do to contribute to a more circular economy. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Michael. Thank you, everyone, for being here, and, and thanks, thanks for the invitation. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Andrew Ellsworth, Doors Unhinged. Uh, we're based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And we have a very simple mission. Uh, we sell reclaimed commercial doors, frames, and hardware. Um, next slide, please. So this is really what this looks like. Okay, uh, we get a call that someone wants to uh, not throw away the stack that's been sitting in a garage somewhere for a long time. And what we do is we turn it into the project that's on the right. Now, two th important things to note here. Uh, number one, um, we are adapting these materials to meet the exact design needs of this project. And that's what uh, the, that's how we would kind of classify this as being an architectural product and not just a building material, right? It's specific to what is, what is being asked for and what is necessary from, a, a, from a, a code standpoint, a functional standpoint and an aesthetic standpoint. Number two, this is a whole system, okay? Doors, frames and hardware work together. Right? And so they have to be thought of as, as a complete system and not just a set of uh, independent products. Next slide. So this is what it looks like. Again, this is uh, on this side is us uh, deconstructing doors ourselves and then turning it, sending it to a nonprofit. Next slide. And again, next slide. 
and again, right? And we have loads of projects like these, right? This is, this is the, the repeatable, scalable model. We take doors in, there's a limited universe of products, and then we can match the needs of projects by uh, just working with them, them being a little bit flexible and uh, kind of filling the gaps of things that we don't have with materials that we purchase new. Uh, next slide. So here is our approach. We certainly didn't invent deconstruction. Uh, and when it comes to doors, uh, we by no means invented it, but we improved it. I would say we know what a good door is. We know what a bad door is. We know how to uh, uh, move and store doors so they don't get damaged. We know what good quality hardware is and what hardware that you should leave behind it. Uh, next, uh, next slide. Here is our warehouse, a uh, little bit of a grainy picture, but as you can see, it's built around working with doors, right? This is, this is what it's built to do, right? We're not trying to get a whole bunch of different materials. We're working with one set of material. On the right, you see the storage of hardware, hinges, closers, and there's other things in the space. Next slide. The other step is turning the products that you saw on the shelf into things that people want to buy. And that includes, it might be cutting, it might be preparing for hinges, it might be cutting for glass, uh, installing hardware. We do some level of sorting and making sure that customers are getting doors that match and uh, match the hardware needs of what they have. Next slide. Uh, and here's some of our projects. So this is what this looks like. This is uh, an arts nonprofit in Pittsburgh. Uh, a few metrics here I'm not gonna talk through in the interest of time. Uh, next slide. Similarly, uh, another great building in an adaptive reuse building in uh, um, an old steel mill in Pittsburgh. Uh, this is a big one for us, one we're particularly proud of, over almost 50 openings. Next slide. Done work with some local universities here, Carnegie Mellon, uh, Duquesne University, um, and looking to expand that. So uh, I'm, there's always more to talk about Doors Unhinged, but I, that's not what I came to talk about today. Uh, next slide, please. I wanted to talk about an ecosystem, right? Because right now we are one of a very small handful of businesses that are actually working in the commercial material space. And so I'm personally interested in, uh, you know, when I started Doors Unhinged at, at creating uh, the, the market and the opportunity for others to get, to get involved and to do the same. Next slide. Here's one really important thing we got to talk about first, though. There's a dramatic difference between residential and commercial uh building building materials and about reuse right they're worlds away okay so we have to understand that we're using different strategies and different ways of handling different customers everything is different about these markets um whereas uh some of the building reuse centers that we saw featured uh which are fantastic you know are, are maybe going to have a little more of a, of a home depot quality of reclaimed materials there's aisles, you know, there's a, you can go into the cart and you can just go shopping. Commercial is totally different. There's no store, right? We're focused on specific material types. We want scale, quantity, uniformity, right? And we're there to match the needs of, of our customers. Next slide. So um, let, I'm not going to dwell too long on this. I just want to call out the opportunity that of commercial material reuse. Um, and so when we look at this pie of construction and demolition waste in the U.S., it's about 170 million tons uh, total. Uh, when we look on the commercial side, we have this big piece of the pie that's demo. That is whole buildings, right? That is masonry, concrete, glass, steel. Um, and that's stuff that's generally best for recycling. Um, but then there's this pie that's renovation in the bottom, which is about 20% of that, which is about interior fit out. Right. These are doors, carpet, ceilings, uh, drywall, partitions, systems, furniture, things that are much less recyclable um, and more frequently replaced. Next slide. So that when we look from a carbon standpoint, people tend to look uh, when they're building the building at the core and shell because all that steel and concrete and masonry and glass has a big carbon footprint. Um, but what they fail to look at is the life cycle of the whole building. Um, if you can click forward, it'll advance this. What we what we see is as building as uh, tenant spaces are, are replaced over and over again, right? Could be every five, 10, 15 years, you're tearing out all those materials and you're putting in new materials. And that carbon is piling up to the point where over the life cycle of the building, it can be almost as much or more, depending on the number of renovations as the core. Uh, next slide. 
So the good news is the answer is reuse, right? We're going to solve both the waste problem and the carbon problem by reuse. Uh, from a from a uh, carbon standpoint, reuse can approximately hit like greater than 95, less than 100% reduction in embodied carbon, right? You're not really going to find that anywhere else. Next slide. Here's the problem. Okay, we don't have the ecosystem and here's what it looks like now, right? A lot of inputs coming in. Um, the, the, the blue uh, arc on the right is essentially the supply that's standing, right, of materials. And then the, the, where it comes down at the bottom, where the arrow meets the black arrow, that's the point of which it's being torn out, right? And right now, most of that stuff is dropping down and going into the landfill. Okay, uh, so what's the opportunity? Next slide. Here's what we want this to look like. Minimal inputs minimal out, minimal uh, waste and just recirculating materials around and around, right? That's the, that's the nature of a circular economy. But it's much more complicated than that, actually. It's not quite as simple as this diagram. Next slide. There are a lot of nodes in here, right? For this to work, this is a whole, uh, you, you know, economy, right? We have to have people that know where the materials are, people that are doing deconstruction, moving, storing, doing something to them, figuring out how to sell it and then delivering it and install it. And we're gonna need some sort of backbone or intelligence uh, network to essentially understand and all these players to see each other and to be able to transact with one another. Next slide. Okay, keep going, there you go. Okay, so I'm sorry, we'll back one. Um, the thing is we need one of these for each material type basically, because they're all different and unique and they have different handling and treatments, right? And so you have all these different ecosystems, right, in these different supply chains, but then they end up working together, right? They can interact with one another. So this is like a 4D, 5D kind of puzzle. Next slide. All right, so we have some problems though, and this is where we wanna to get to the difference between residential and commercial. So uh, I was sitting at a, at a conference, listening to people talking about the importance of deconstruction ordinances, and then just realizing I was like, that's the wrong thing for what we want in commercial. In residential, it makes sense because there's really there's really good demand, and the, ag, the the materials though often get locked up in small projects all over the place. So deconstruction ordinances are really good at kind of unlocking that supply. In the commercial sector, we have the opposite problem, right? We have what I would describe as basically infinite supply of material, but we have almost nowhere to send it. We have like no demand right now, and so a deconstruction ordinance, we don't need it to unlock more supply, right? We need to unlock demand. So that's, that's what we aim to endeavor. Next slide. I'm a co-founder of an initiative called All for Reuse that's really about buying reclaim and how we foster that ecosystem and how we create those enterprises from making these commitments that we're gonna buy the materials. If the materials don't have anywhere to go, then they're not, then we, we can't store them indefinitely, right? Next slide, please. Okay, so what this is, buy reclaim for commercial interior products. That's about large portfolio uh, owners, colleges and universities, large corporations with like sustainable, uh, you know, various commitments, ESG and things like that, and government agencies. I'm going to talk a little more about that today. So uh, next slide. These are our goals. Um, it's really about quickly reducing environmental impact related to waste and carbon, uh, protecting natural resources, creating that... Uh, ecosystem of enterprises that can help support that and to do it fast right we don't have 15 20 years for this to become a real thing we are the the deadline that everyone's talking about is really 2020 2030 and maybe even 2025 we got to start figuring this out and we don't have time to waste next slide this is our group um we're uh, uh really a nice uh, bunch of um designers um builders um, and consultants. Um, this is our steering committee, and then we have a network of, uh, of professionals around the country. Can't dwell on this too much. I want to keep going. Next slide. Here's government's role in this. Okay, the government could, can really play an important role. Ultimately, issues of waste and climate change are going to land at the feet of government in one way or another. Right? You're going to end up ultimately being responsible for solving some of these problems, as we talked about today. Um, it, also, these governments have made commitments already, you know, about net zero waste, net zero uh, energy, things like that. And reuse can be a great support for that, as well as create jobs. Um, I believe that government needs to be able to demonstrate that something is possible in, in new and innovative spaces um, before they're necessarily mandating others to do the same thing. Next slide. 
Okay, so we think about ecosystem, we're working at different scales. We're maybe a node in a regional scale, and we have the idea of working in regional hubs, and then these hubs can kind of work together. All right, so uh, the different pieces that do different things. Next slide. I'll give you an analogy of why we need to think of, the, of this in the ecosystem. If you look at organics and composting, right? Nature has blessed us with an ecosystem to turn uh, food waste and scraps into usable uh, fertilized soil, right? Um, we didn't have to do anything, it just kind of appears, right? The worms, the uh, everything in the rhizo, you know, the rhizosphere, right? Like the bugs, the, the bacteria, it's, it's amazing, right? And that's essentially what we want to do with technical nutrients, with building materials, right? Take these materials, do something with them, and send them back into a building. Next slide. If we don't have the ecosystem, we're kind of stuck, right? And if food waste would just stay food waste, uh, building materials would essentially just go to the landfill like they're doing now. This is where we are, right? We don't have the ecosystem, so we're ending a lot with the picture on the bottom right. Next slide. Okay. So I hope to not upset you all. I saw there are a lot of people from uh, local and state government, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that. And I'd love to like see what your, what your thought is. Okay, so what should government sh should and should not do um, to help foster this ecosystem? Next slide. Okay, um, enterprise perspective. I'll, I'll, we'll use us, uh, Doors Unhinged, as an example. If we were gonna launch, a, uh, expand our business, or say we were launching a business from scratch in the Boston area. It is risky, it's cash intensive. These are the questions we would ask. Are there customers and projects for us to serve and be profitable? Um, is there a warehouse space that we can access that's um, gonna be scalable and affordable? Um, do we have partners, right? We can't do everything by ourselves. And how are we gonna pay for this, right? How are we gonna bridge those startup costs? Next slide. And so, Government has a perfect opportunity to answer those questions, right? We have to get rid of all these barriers that, that keep government from really buying reclaimed materials and really double down on that and make those commitments saying, we are gonna be those first buyers, right? We're gonna be there to buy those materials. So you enterprise, you launch, and you over there, you want launch too, and we're gonna buy your materials. That think, think of the comparison to green power and Big organizations make say, we're gonna buy all this green power and people say, all right, I'm going to build a wind farm, I'm going to build a solar farm. Because they know that demand is there, right? Okay, next thing government can do is to convene players, other buyers like large universities um, and uh, corporations, right? Bring in, bring people to the table, set the table to create that ecosystem. Um, we can also bring both of those together with, with the space and the financing to do incubation. Um, here's what I think you should not do, and I don't know if you caught it the first time. Don't do deconstruction ordinances for commercial materials. That's like step eight, okay? And when that point where the ecosystem is fairly mature and we wanna squeeze that last bit, that, those, like, those laggards who refuse to do it, that's what that tool is for. It's not gonna start the industry, it will kill the industry before it even gets started if it's at the wrong time. Okay, um, we, uh, sorry. Um, don't just go pick up a warehouse and start stocking it full of materials with no plan for it to go anywhere, okay? That's not gonna create demand. I'm gonna tell you that firsthand. That is not gonna create demand, okay? Um, so do that in tandem with how we're gonna create new businesses. Um, and also don't do, I, I think policy in this standpoint should be about what government is gonna do uh, with their own money and not what other people need to do with their money. Uh, next slide. Okay. I'm gonna make. I'm gonna throw out a scenario that's that's totally hypothetical, but maybe it's in line with what's going on there. Let's say hypothetically that governments uh, on various levels in Massachusetts spend 300 million a year on capital projects. I personally think that's probably low, but we're just gonna use that number. We'll take a stab at say 20% of that is the materials that the cost of money, the amount of money spent on materials. So that's 60 million dollars, right? That is kind of a pool at which you could say, hey, that, that's, that's, our, that's our funding stream, right? That's our funding stream to start new enterprises. If we can make those commitments and we can channel those to say, we're gonna spend that money on reuse or some of that money or, or you know, a fraction of that money, it's still gonna be really impactful. We don't need to go get government grants that are, that are inconsistent and gonna expire and may probably not be enough in the first place, right? When what we need to do is actually to create the market signal with the money you're already spending. Uh, 
Is there anyone on the call that's in procurement or works in, you know, uh, letting capital projects in any levels of government here? I'd love to see a note in the chat if you do, um, because those are the right people to have at the table. If we don't have them in the room, then that's a problem because those people are the ones that are actually making the decisions about which materials are going into projects. And they're the ones that are like, you know, responsible for delivering high quality buildings. So how do we do both? I challenge you all to kind of figure out what the exact numbers are. What is, what is the, the, the market potential? How much do you all spend on capital? Um, next slide. Okay, so similar to this, uh, um, that we, uh, this diagram I showed before. Um, Money is what makes the system go around, right? It's not the materials, it's the, it's, it's the transaction, it's the purchase. Um, when we look at the bottom, deconstruction ordinances are basically gonna, gonna create a little more of a demand for deconstruction contractors and say that apply a cost for, to get rid of a material. Uh, a door might be worth $20. Like um, you, could, you could, I would take, 10 bucks, 20 bucks to take a door. Um, occasionally I would pay about that much, you know. That's not, gonna, that's not gonna move the market, right? Up top, when we go to sell that door back to a new buyer, I'm charging $200, $250, right? That sale is what's gonna make the entire rest of the ecosystem work, right? We need that transaction. And that's the transaction that's unlocked by procurement and by demand, right? I don't want to forget about the part in the middle. Government and foundations love to kind of keep things afloat and be like, hey, we have this great thing. Let's just keep it going. Keep these reuse centers open or, or these drop-off centers, whatever it is. That is inconsistent money, right? That is the money that's not going to last forever. And we can't rely on it to hold, hold, the, ecos, you know, hold the water for the ecosystem, right? We need that transaction to do the heavy lifting and the inconsistent money to kind of fill in the gaps until we can really get it standing on its own. So next slide the model of the incubator, all right? Think of a building, right, with businesses, a, a couple, I, I, hypothetically three reuse businesses that are sharing resources, whether it's trucks, forklifts, racking, whatever. Um, a stream of materials comes in, they do their own things. And then these same buyers that we talked about as the big portfolio owners are the ones that are buying it, right? There may be some opportunity where by underwriting this type of incubator, they can access maybe some portion of free materials. Free materials changes the nature of like how people, you, uh, architects specify. It was like, oh, that's free. So yeah, we can totally use that and avert all those like uh, barriers that I, that I decided to invent for new materials. Um, so what this looks like is we have some private investment. We have some foundation investment to keep this thing going. And we have government that can hopefully both provide real estate and provide demand, right? And the idea is how do we spin off these companies to be independent and locally owned within five to seven years and then bring new companies in, right? This is a model that's gonna help to, to do all those things and, and, absolve, and resolve some of those risks that we talked about early on. Okay, next slide. Okay, tons of benefits. This is a public-private partnership, right? In, 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 the, in the truest sense, I would say. We're gonna create jobs, right? We're gonna foster that local economy and create new enterprises that are gonna keep wealth. Um, and it's gonna be driven based on the value of those materials that were going to be trash, that you were going to have to pay to get rid of, right? We are going to have that ecosystem in place, both regionally and by you doing it regionally, it's gonna help drive it nationally. It's gonna normalize the practice of reuse on projects by architects, designers, contractors, right? Government can lead the way on that. And of course, we're gonna diverse way, divert waste, we're gonna avoid CO2, and we're gonna protect natural resources. This is wins all around, all around. Okay, next slide. All right, um, lots of materials to, out there to consider, but I think when you have lower volume, you need to start with higher margin. That's why we did doors, right? Um, high margin product, um, that we can make a, a give people a deal on while also uh, being able to keep our doors open, right? Here are some others: casework, workstations, uh, small electrical, small mechanical. Um, those are the things that where the money is. As the volume increases, then we can get to the the more recognizable higher uh, higher volume, lower margin products like insulation and carpet and ceilings and things like that. 
Um, so you need an enterprise to really to work in one material type, in my opinion. If you try and to have a little bit of everything, then you're going to be nothing to no one. Um, so the specialization is actually what makes Doors Unhinged uh, successful. Next slide. And this is where I'm going to close out here. I know we're short on time. So um, if you're looking to achieve zero waste, if you're looking to um, divert materials, if you're looking to solve your waste problem, um, you have to buy reclaimed. That's the end of story, right? We are not going to solve this by deconstruction is, is another version of a way if you don't actually do anything with it. And if you start by doing something with it and creating that demand, then the deconstruction will solve itself, in my opinion, because it will be a valuable commodity. Next slide. That's all I have. Um, really appreciate you all uh, thinking about this, having this group, talking about this. I always say we got to talk about this like it's a real thing for it to become a real thing. It's going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. We have partners around the country that are doing great work, and you all are doing great work too. Really, really appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, what a detailed presentation and some great explanations. Uh, now that the presentations are done, I'll look to hand the mic back to Kathy and invite our presenters to answer any questions for the next 15 or so minutes um, that the audience has asked. Great. Thank you so much for these phenomenal presentations. Um, really a tremendous amount of information. It looks like there's been a lot of action in the chat. Um, Brooke, I think that you are there as well, that you probably have been screening the chat during these presentations um, right yeah yes would you like me to take 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 it away go for it I'll thank do, you i'll do my best we've got a lot of um, great questions ranging from the super technical to um broader policy stuff so um and, and i'll invite folks to kathy if you want to keep an eye on uh we could even close out the slides and then see people who are raising their hands because if i don't call on you and you've got a burning question that i missed or you just thought of something um, we can also call on people to unmute themselves um so let's see we had a question about um does boston building resources provide tax credits and core did answer that in um in the chat box here hang on one second um and uh, okay, let me just get myself oriented here. Um, and I believe that was that was a yes. We've had or, or no, I'm sorry. Um, we've had several questions about um, lead paint and in salvage environments and how that is addressed. Um, and this is out. Uh, City of Salem particularly noted that this has been a problem. There's been pushback from the Salem Historical Commission on efforts to encourage reuse of buildings um, when a historic building is demolished. Somebody else also asked about that. Does is there anybody um, anybody on our panel or also in the audience? Because I do want to know. We have some other uh, real national subject matter experts. Um, Dave Benick is here with us, and also Brad Guy, um, who might want to weigh in as well. So I would invite. Um, invite our panelists to try and answer questions or feel free to unmute yourself if you want to join in. So any anybody want to talk take on lead paint? And Kathy, if you see a, a question, I'm I'm focused on the Yeah, I'm looking to chat. see I don't see I don't see any raised hands at the moment, but if um <laughs> if one of our specialists, I think Pam maybe speaking now. Yes. Uh, Thank Come you. On <laughs> this is one of my favorite questions. I used to um, really believe that lead paint create lead paint and its asbestos abatement create jobs as well as any other part of the reuse industry. Um, if we can um, routinize it and we can have the processing setups, it it can deleading can go very smoothly. Um, we restore old windows. Old windows are, you know, 99% lead of, of them are lead paint. Old doors are 99% lead paint. And yet the wood is some of the most valuable wood that is on the market. So I do think that there are a lot of things that we can do for lead paint. And I'd like to hear what other people are doing. Thank you. And I, I did see somebody post that um, a reuse, building materials reuse place in 
in Portland, Oregon, I believe that they label it. That if there's that there's a labeling require uh, a labeling option that says this contain a disclosure essentially, um, and then that they even provide a a flyer um, with EPA information about lead paint. So, because I think the question is, can you actually resell materials that have that you're known to have lead paint on them? Does anybody else want to try and take that on? And I'm going to keep scrolling through questions here. Um, no hands raised at this point okay. yet. Okay. Um, can I, can I, Xander, can I just volunteer please, something from, please. from the Thank commercial you. perspective is that um, lead point is kind of a mood issue for us. We don't actually like, there's so much material that's post lead paint era that's usable that like, we don't bother with that. We don't bother with stuff that's that old because we mm -hmm. want to sell things that people want to have. And so again, from a commercial perspective, like I, I, we don't, we don't really deal with that. There's, I'm not going to disagree. There's, there's really valuable material. Um, there's an important need for salvage and historic preservation of, of materials that have lead-based paints on them. But I just want to make sure that gets compartmentalized and like thinking about like this issue goes with these strategies and not an issue for everyone. Thank you for that good point. And I think that's also sort of underscores the difference that you made really well, Andrew, which is residential and commercial are two completely different animals. I know I've owned 200 year old homes in Boston and both of them had you know, between six and 10 doors stored in the basement. In other words, they came with a house because uh, most of these houses had lots of doors on them and they were built to keep heat into you know, a single room, but um, that's yeah, completely different source. Um, so there's been, um, let's see, discussion about barn reclamation and folks um, and how many barns just simply rot in place. Um, let's see, um, question about diversion of materials once they, they go mixed um, to a, a handling facility. Um, and what percentage of actually gets sorted out, um, but I think Somebody, Mike Ellie, um, one of my colleagues has answered that question. Um, so we'll leave that. Um, okay, let's see here. And Kathy, feel free to jump in if you're seeing things I'm missing. Um, can I ask a question going back to the first question? Sorry, I'm going to ask if I can ask a question then ask it. Yes, so go ahead, Abby. Going back to the first question about um, donation receipts. I would love um, Eco Building Bargains and Boston Building Resources to talk through how that's benefited some of their customers and encourage, like really encourage either a contractor to do, you know, do more deconstruction or uh, is that's like a selling point for their customer that perhaps is the homeowner or maybe it's the homeowner directly and um, I guess talking through that process a bit more since it's not the actual donation, the tax exemption, but the donation receipt that someone can then use on their taxes. But, yeah, I, I can I can speak to what we do. So we do acknowledge donations um, when they come in. So it's not a tax credit per se, but, you know, somebody will receive um, for a standard donation at the door, uh, you know, something that says, thank you for your donation of used building materials. And then it's the recipient's responsibility to value that when they file their tax returns. Um, for donations over $5,000, then the if the recipient wants to claim a credit then this is where an appraiser is involved again these are things that the donor coordinates but you know we will sign off that we've received the goods uh, and then only for the you know very largest donations that we might receive does it you know trigger the reporting requirements and our tax filings um, that we need to make note of you know who who it was and what was donated but you know people certainly get the receipt and, and that's absolutely a value uh, both to individuals and, you know, if it's a contractor that will pass that on to uh, the end customer, it is it is a selling point, so to speak. Um, here's a question for Andrew. Uh, how does it work for the fire ratings on the reclaimed doors for commercial applications? Um, yeah, it's doable. So they have to come in with a label and then you have to understand enough to know what the label means. Um, which typically has to do with um, to oversimplification, the amount of glass that's 
that's allowable and then certain other functionality of it. And so um, we need to make sure that we're, we do sell doors with the labels on them and that they go out consistent with the intent and the legality of those labels. So we don't alter labels, we don't apply labels. Um, it's a fraction of the doors that we receive have labels on them. And we often end up buying a lot of them. And that's sort of the edge condition stuff. Like we, they need those, right? They can't, they have to buy them. So we furnish those as just being able to deliver the entire pack, door package for the project. Great. There's one other question in the chat from uh, about doors and then I'll go to the question that I see Martha, you've raised your hand online. Um, the other question about doors while we're on the topic from Brad Guy asking any other products made from doors besides refurbished doors like panels, tables, et cetera. And then we'll go to Martha. Um, I, sure. Yeah. I mean, there's, is a, a, from what I understand, Amazon in their offices uses doors as tables, right? There's some, it's a frugality thing that they, they do. And, um, I think there's certainly room for that. There, there's no one stopping anyone from doing that. I would say there's two points to that. One is, does that table ever become a door again? Um, in terms of circularity, is that where it stops? Um, and number two, are you able to sell a thousand doors a year as tables, right? And so what's the scale of that repurposing in terms of like, you know, again, keeping materials in circulation? So I think it's totally, I like, I have lots of door tables, as you would imagine, right? When you have nearly an infinite number of doors, you find a lot of uses for it. Um, and so uh, I would also say there's a value issue too, that uh, like something that's used just as a surface, it might be worth about 40 or $50 at most. And, you know, we try and sell ours in the range of 200 to 200. Thank you. Um, Martha, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question, go for it. Thank you. I put this in the chat, but I think we got past it. Um, so I come from a different perspective. Um, I'm, I'm on a school committee in the Eastern Massachusetts, and there are lots of schools in Massachusetts that are more than 60 years old that are looking to be replaced. And most of them are gonna be uh, torn down and something new is going to get put in. And I, I'm on the school building committee. I want to know what is being done. What can I do at that scale for encouraging or requiring our builders and designers to deconstruct and send things for reuse as well as to source materials for the new building. So like we couldn't take doors. We need certain standards of doors for schools and things like that. But do, does anyone here have experience or uh, ideas of ways that we could do it at that scale? Kathy, okay, I see Dave Benick raised his hand, and I know he's been on call to answer questions. So I'm going to guess maybe that Dave, you have you can address that. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I've been listening, and I appreciate all the speakers. I've saved a thousand pounds from the landfill while I'm listening. I have my headset on. So we're we're taking a building apart as we speak, but. We've done 177 school projects in our time. Uh, we've saved uh, over 10 million pounds from those projects. Uh, we just finished a high school. We saved 120,000 pounds of material in 30 days of being on that project. And basically what we found is that there's a system in place that kind of prevents the reuse in most cases, you have a system where you can't give the materials away. And if the school district um, doesn't need the materials, they actually incur a lot of cost of saving the materials for themselves. So they really have to think through whether they need it or not. And um, so this project was a great example of what can be done. Um, not only did we save 120,000 pounds, but the school district did repurpose a lot of materials into the new high school. They put a lot of materials into other schools in the district and they put materials in their storage units. But the, the, uh, the way it was done is at the moment the a building area was turned over to the contractor, it instantly became the contractor's material. And we were contracted with them to salvage materials. And so we use this really limited amount of time, this small window of opportunity 
um, and we've done it over and over again. We actually turned the whole project into a fundraiser for the school and surprised them with it. So we, we were able to raise $3,000 uh, that we donated back to the school to buy equipment for uh, students with special needs. So if you wanna talk about it, look me up. I have a lot of answers that we don't have time for now. Can you, uh, what company are you with? Can you put it in the chat or something? Yeah, sure. Yep, yep. Uh, I will do that. And, and I'll just add, I'll just add um, that mass, in terms of what's in a school building too, um, most desks, furniture, fixtures, lab equipment, you name it, often just go straight into the dumpster when a school is being renovated or even um, demolished. MassDP's website, and I can post that in the chat, we have resources for how to recover all those materials that can be reused. There are companies on state contract that can do that. And we've created a template um, for a request for proposal. So resources for, for basically, it's sometimes being called soft strip, but recovering what's in the building is, um, it, we do have help for that. Um, Okay, Be let's. I'm sorry, before we move forward, Brooke, if you want to look for the next question, but I just wanted to chime in for just a moment. Martha, you may want to connect with me offline, but there um, are standards that we're just at the front end of learning about with respect to school buildings and demolition and or deconstruction. So these CHIP standards for high performance schools or LEED standards, um, my understanding, um, very cursory understanding is there are some components that provide extra points for how those materials are managed for reuse or recycling. So um, if, we, if you'd like to talk offline, I think we could delve into that a little more. Thank you. Thank you. Here's an interesting policy question, and this is from um, somebody in the Midwest um, asking, are there any resources, um, policy or programmatic that would help to ensure new construction will be suitable for reuse and deconstruction later? So thinking ahead, building, Groundwork. Anybody want to take that on? I'm going to, let's see, move on here. Um, that that might, I don't know if that reflects on what Dave Benick shared at our last meeting back in December about design for disassembly to some extent. Mm. Um, but we do have the recording and the presentations from our December meeting that may touch on on those ideas. I, I would partially answer that question in as much as, uh, and it's been stated in the chat, and I believe some of the speakers have spoke to it. It's going to be very important if you don't have kind of an overarching policy that's pushing this, that the decisions made in designing those schools and those buildings are going forward with, once again, designing for disassembly. And I think at that point, material choice is very important. Um, there's a lot of different certifications out there for, for building materials, especially kind of in those large commercial capacities um, and making sure that the, the owner and designer are kind of really aligned in what's going into the new project to make sure that at its end of life, it is reclaimable. A lot of problems that we've even spoke to it today um, is that when trying to either soft strip or, or deconstruct or to kind of salvage these materials. Uh, they weren't kind of installed by the contractor with the idea of pulling them out. These materials maybe weren't made to kind of be reused in the typical fashion. So any new construction would really uh, have to focus on that. And, and while it can be seen as I think this very, uh, very large, uh, overwhelming possibility, but once again, there are a lot of certifications, there are a lot of material banks and websites that designers and owners can use to make sure what's going in can easily be pulled out, is healthy, is safe, kind of the more holistic sustainability approach. Thank you, Michael. Um, and one more response to the school question. Um, Jennifer Doherty is here from Mass Historical Commission. She posted in the chat that if the school project is receiving state funds, it'll go through review of um, Mass Historical Commission, and they could potentially put in deconstruction as mitigation for adverse effects of demolition. So there's some good, some great responses here. Um, let's see. Oh, thank you. Janine Bishop posted the link to uh, reuse and recycling of school furniture, fixtures, and equipment. So that's our web page with a bunch of resources there. Um, let's see, what am I missing? Please feel free. Oh, I've, I see a webinar that CET, Center for Ecotechnology, is hosting for the Connecticut, um, for Conne in Connecticut on March 28th called Deconstructing Deconstruction with a link to register. So it looks like a free um, workshop there. 
what have I missed? Um, please feel free. Yeah, there's some fantastic resources that people are putting yeah. in, in the chat here. Yeah, please grab them. We will also save the chat. Um, but I encourage folks, if you want to raise your hand, it might be a little bit easier to see if your question's embedded in there. But um, Dave Benick, I think your hand's still up. I'm not sure. Maybe maybe you need, wanted to lower that. Um, Looks like there was a question for John Celeste and what's the cutoff age for appliances or does it vary? And maybe Boston Building Resources has a... Thank yeah. you, Abby. Yes. Uh, yes, our, our cutoff is uh, seven years. Um, but again, like I said before, these like it is personalized. Uh, so oftentimes if we, when we do a free site visit uh, and I can see that these appliances are in good working order and clean, we, we can make an exception, um, especially if these appliances are kind of built into these kitchens. We often see these sub zeros, you know, with the same paneling as the, as the uh, cabinets and, um, those the, again that's something that i would as i mentioned in my presentation that that'd be a situation where i would say either let me come onto site let me grab the model number serial number find out the exact manufacturing date um or i can get an approval uh, uh, elsewise i wanted to um think um say that we do i appreciated andrew's um comments about the purchasing power of state and local government. Um, we know it's significant. Massachusetts does have a director of sustainable purchasing. Um, she has attended some of these meetings. I'm going to make sure I reach out to her. We also do have somebody on the call from the Department of Capital Asset Management, which manages all of the state real estate. And um, he is, Khalil is very interested in deconstruction. Um, we plan to reach out also to connect with our leading by example uh, office for state government. So just Thank you for, for that, uh, for driving that point home. And did I interrupt somebody there at the end? I think somebody was trying to say something. No, I, I was just gonna say on the appliance question, we'll we'll reach back to 15 years if in if in good condition. Okay. Particularly if it's a premium brand. I had a question for um, Eco Building Bargains for John. And that was, I, I noted that you, you said free, we do a free site visit, we do a, we remove your materials for free. And I'm just wondering um, why you're not charging a fee for service. Just, just curious um, because it's a valid, it's a, it's a, you're providing a service. seems like it's. Well, I, mean, I think, I mean, I think that's kind of a, that's, that's kind of a driving force to, you know, move the needle in this industry. Um, you know, if we're, if we're, if we're already having a hard time getting people on board uh, with recycling these materials mm -hmm. and reusing these materials, I think that's just another hurdle. Um, you know, yeah. I think it's just another hurdle uh, that we don't need to put up. Okay. So you're saying if you told somebody it was going to cost, they'd say, ah, I changed my mind. I'm not really that interested. Yeah. No, no, yeah. no, no real need for that hurdle, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. If, if, right. if, I, if I can add to that, we, we used to charge, uh, you know, $35 pickup fee. And over the last month or so, we've actually been trialing, uh, just asking for a donation. So uh, no, no charge, but it's a suggested donation of $35. And if you know, you'd like to give more, we, we would be uh, grateful. Um, and so people who can give more have been coming through to do that. And some don't give anything, uh, but on balance, it's uh, encouraging. Yeah, and I, thank you. And I think it really goes into, you know, building the relationships with the contractors too. Um, our, our really, we really try and be kind of like the duck on the pond and do all the work without anybody really seeing it. Um, so once we start asking people for money, I think it just, you know, again, adds those hurdles we don't need to add. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Uh, let's see, a question about for eco building bargains and Boston building resources. Do you post dimensions of your windows and doors or keep a list for easy review if a customer calls in looking for a certain size? Can you, can you read that? Sorry, I missed the first yeah, part of that. Just wondering if you keep, do you have an inventory um, with dimensions of your of doors and windows? So if somebody calls in and says, I'm looking for a door that's, you know, 32 by, um, you know, 72, would you, is that a part of your inventory process? So, so we do, um, we do have some of our materials. We're trying to get as many of our materials online as possible. Um, but I think that really goes back to the all-star staff I was telling you about. Um, we do encourage, you can call in at any point and ask that exact question. 
and we will have somebody that will go out there and look for that those exact dimensions look for the door you're looking for look for the window you're looking for um, we also do online actual online sales um, so you can call in facetime with our sales consultants at the store and they will go over an entire kitchen cabinet set with you they'll go over all the dimensions with you um, like like i wasn't kidding when i said we have an all-star staff there <laughs> Thank you. That's great to know. Um, I've got a question here too, to me asking if we could all share contact info. And I appreciate that. I mean, I think that, that that's one of the um, many benefits of bringing people together on these calls is the connections that are made. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll throw this out and say, if you have an objection or don't want to see your contact information shared, um, email Kathy Mirza, but um, uh, I think it's a great idea. The, the connecting, the connections are just so critical as we're building this, this ecosystem. So we will follow up on that, Lisa. Thanks for that suggestion. Let's see. And I'll put my email in the chat and it's 301 right now. Okay. So I'm just going to put that in there for anyone to reach yeah. out to me if you would not like, if you would like us to not share your info. And thank you, Dave Benick. Just put his um, information into the chat as well. Let's see. It looks like it's got, yes, yeah, got your website. And so that's helpful. Um, and so we're right on time. Kathy, are you? Uh, yeah, I think we should. Here? Yeah, I think we'll wrap it up. I had a couple of closing slides, but I, frankly, I don't even think we need to go to those um, because I'll share the presentations with everybody who registered here. And they really just, um, the, there were a couple of slides about um, some of our grants and that help support deconstruction in one way or another. There's a micro grant for businesses and institutions primarily. And then there is a larger grant for municipalities that has um, a number of choices as to how they might wanna dip their toe in the water with deconstruction and earn some points to earn some revenue through our grants. Um, if we're going to plan our next meeting, which we plan expect will be in mid June. And so the details will be forthcoming as well as a link to that to register for that meeting. But right now we we expect that that meeting will be about how um, historic preservation can help support adaptive reuse and deconstruction. So we'll look at how those um, interest areas combine. But um, we welcome your feedback, your thoughts on these meetings, any suggestions, because we're trying to do these deep dives into these topics. And as you can see, there's a lot to learn here. But I'm grateful that you all joined us today and really want to say thank you to our speakers and to Michael Orbank to helping to facilitate uh, the conversations and the presentations. Thank you all. Um, so be on the lookout for the follow up. And we'll also be posting the presentations and the recording to Mass DEP's website in the next uh, couple of weeks. Okay, so thank you all. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Okay, have a great day. Good job, you guys. Thanks again for having us. So glad you could join. Have a great weekend. You too. You too.